The Securities and Exchange Commission administers a number of statutes under the jurisdiction of the Committee on Energy and Commerce in the area of securities and finance. These laws are designed to protect the investing public by providing full disclosure, by regulating the nation's securities markets, by preventing and policing fraud and malpractice in the, in the securities and financial markets. Historically, the Commission has performed its job well in protecting the investors and has fulfilled its major role in preserving the integrity and sound operation of the nation's securities markets. Recent developments in the world of finance, investment, and securities taken with the current international environment highlight the enormity of the SEC's task. They also give rise to questions whether the SEC is able to continue to effectively carry out the mandate that the Congress has given it and whether it will be able to do so in the future. Chair would like to cite a few examples of recent events all falling under the scrutiny of the Securities and Exchange Commission. The default of the Washington Public Power Supply System, the one-day decline in the stock market of 508.32 points on a volume of 604 million shares. That's the, that is the market crash of October 19, uh, of October 19, 1987 and a $25 billion plus buyout of RGR Nabisco. The chair will not go on and cite the evidences of fraud, insider trading, abuse, misbehavior, and other things that have been going on in the financial markets. Nor is it necessary for the chair to cite the great loss of public confidence in, on the part especially of small investors in the way the market is being conducted. Indeed, there is a public perception out there that the market has ceased to be a generation device for capital for the nation and has become a crapshoot. The question before the committee and the SEC is what are the resources, weapons, available to the SEC to carry out its responsibilities? This year, the budget of the commission is $142.6 million. While this represents a $7.4 million increase over fiscal year 1988, after absorbing the 4.1 percent pay increase scheduled for January 1989 and annualizing the fiscal 1988 appropriated positions and paying other mandatory based increases, the Commission will actually undergo a shortfall of $3 million and obviously a diminution of its ability to carry out its proper and appointed functions. While the SEC staff positions have remained virtually constant over the last decade, all indicators of market activity, including the number of registered broker-dealers and investment advisors and investment companies, as well as trading volumes on all exchanges, have increased dramatically and vastly disproportionately to the SEC's resources. Indicators of fraud as well as customer complaints about broker-dealer practices have also increased significantly. The nation has seen and can expect to see further development of new securities products and trading strategies and the internationalization of the securities markets. In addition, there have been calls for expanded SEC authority to address the prevailing uh, climate of leverage buyouts and consequences which are not yet fully understood to that phenomenon. The Commission's budget has consistently lagged behind the appropriated budgets of the musical bands of the military services. While I'm a great lover, of music and military bands in, in particular, I find that this is a curious apportionment of the nation's resources. This year, 167.5 million compared to the SEC's 142.6 million are the exact figures. Again, I do not wish to disparage the usefulness of military bands to the morale and to the recruiting of the armed forces, but I think it is time to question whether as a matter of policy the public benefits from military bands uh, exceed the benefits to a society of maintaining fair and orderly markets for the long-term development of U.S. business and industry. The SEC has filed a massive civil lawsuit alleging the rigging of corporate takeovers, stock manipulation, and fraud. It has been suggested that the subject of that complaint, Drexel Burnham Lambert, may in its defense spend mounts in excess of the entire budget of the SEC. While the SEC tries to recruit entry-level attorneys at a $27,000 salary, it competes with private New York law firms who may offer the same attorney $84,000. It is little wonder that Chairman Reuter has described the SEC 
as a peanut agency doing a giant job. Our hope here this morning is to develop the basis for helping the agency become a giant to deal with the giant problems it confronts. All estimates and projections suggest the problem presented the SEC will become more acute in the future, not less acute. It is my firm view that something must be done to address the growing deficiencies in the resources available to the SEC to carry out its statutory responsibilities. It is also my view that unless something is done, serious problems to the economy could occur. One mechanism for increasing the SEC's revenue has been suggested, that has been suggested and is the subject of today's hearings. That mechanism, commonly, commonly referred to as self-funding, would allow the agency to use fees collected as an offsetting receipt against appropriations. The SEC does collect a large number of fees based on the registration of securities under the Securities Act of 1933 and the securities transactions under the Securities Act of 1934. These fees, when collected by the SEC, are deposited in the general fund of the U.S. Treasury. Since 1983, the aggregate fee revenue of the Commission has exceeded its appropriation. And during the past several years, the fee revenue has more than doubled the agency's appropriation. The Commission has just completed its study of the various options for increasing SEC revenues by transforming the SEC from an appropriate agency to a, to a self-funding agency outside the usual constraints appropriated uh, agency's fiscal response, responsibilities and operations. The committee is delighted to welcome the chairman of the SEC, Mr. David Ruder, and Executive George Kundal uh, to the subcommittee to present and discuss the SEC's report. Before we recognize you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Kundal, the chair will recognize uh, the distinguished minority member of the full committee, Mr. Lent, for an opening statement and then, then other members of the committee as, as quickly as the chair can. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I just learned, and perhaps before we begin, uh, I would like to extend my best wishes and those of the members on my side of the aisle, Pat McLean, seated here between us, Mr. Chairman, who's leaving the subcommittee on oversight and investigations after uh, 14 years now of service. Uh, Patrick has always discharged his responsibilities in a professional manner, and uh, we will miss his expertise in oversight matters. Good luck, Patrick. Uh, this morning we're meeting to discuss some of uh, the alternative mechanisms for funding the SEC in order to guarantee that the Commission will be able to carry out its statutory mandate to protect investors and ensure fair and orderly markets. In particular, we, we will be looking at the SEC's, SEC's self-funding study to determine if self-funding is a feasible alternative. We've gotten to this point because the regular appropriations process has not produced a level of funding for the SEC in recent years that has been adequate to keep up with the increasing demands placed upon the Commission. The amount appropriated to the SEC for FY89 was about $142 million. This was $18 million below the President's budget request of $160 million, a level that would have permitted the Commission to expand in some much needed areas and $30 million below the authorized amount. The appropriated amount of $142 million is not only insufficient to provide expansion, it appears that after mandated pay increases take effect in January, the Commission will have a shortfall of about $3 million from current operations. While the SEC is certainly not unique among federal agencies in its desire for higher funding, there are a number of compelling reasons for increasing the resources available to the SEC. Uh, first of all, basic changes in the securities market have placed additional burdens on the Commission. In the last several years, we've witnessed an explosion in financial markets. This is reflected in the greatly increased numbers of transactions and participants in the markets. It's also reflected in innovative products, more complex and sophisticated deals, and the internationalization of markets. The SEC's job has become more complex, and yet we are asking the Commission to get by without significant increases in staff and with civil service restrictions that result in rapid turnover of highly trained personnel. Secondly, we must keep in mind the importance of the SEC's mission. Our free market system rests upon the faith of investors. Investors must have confidence that fair and orderly markets will be maintained and that investors will be protected from illegal and unscrupulous practices. It is therefore essential that we keep the SEC's resources at a level where the Commission can fully carry out these important functions. In, this is particularly true 
after the market break of 1987 and with the volatility we've experienced in the markets. Another factor that distinguishes the SEC from most other agencies is that it collects fees for filings with the Commission <coughs> on Securities Transactions. In recent years, these fees have increased rapidly. Where they once approximately equaled the Commission's budget, these fee revenues have been about double the SEC budget in the last few years. This has been a windfall to the Treasury since all of this revenue goes directly to the Treasury but is of no benefit to the SEC because the Commission does not have access to these funds. These fees were never meant to be a general revenue raiser and we would not view them that way. The increase in fee revenue primarily reflects an increase in market activity and therefore in the workload of the SEC. The SEC should have some ability to have access to these funds. The increase in workload the fundamental importance of the SEC's mission, and the increase in revenue should be recognized in the appropriations process. And because they have not been, the SEC has been left with inadequate resources and we are left looking for alternatives. I realize that there may be technical difficulties in working out the details of a self-funding scheme, but the SEC study is a constructive first step, and I look forward to an examination of the concept this morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Gentleman from Oregon, Mr. White. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to commend you for going forward with this very important uh, inquiry, and I certainly want to associate myself with your remarks and that uh, of our ranking minority member, Mr. Uh, Lent. I would observe, uh, Mr. Chairman, a particular concern of mine is that SEC staff years expended for prevention and suppression of fraud are actually less in fiscal year 1989 than they were in fiscal year 1979. I think that's of great concern to this committee and uh, certainly uh, your track record on the question of prevention and suppression of frauds uh, causes us to certainly want to follow that up. It seems to me that for the Securities and Exchange Commission to dig into cases like the Washington Public Power Supply System and Drexel with such limited resources is a little like trying to fight Godzilla with a slingshot. And no case, in my view, shows the agency's dilemma better than the whoops default, which is of great importance in my region. Just last September, Mr. Reuter sent to Congress a 376-page staff report documenting failures by the underwriters, the bond council, and the special counsel. Yet the SEC chose not to pursue the case. They noted that the whoops bondholders trustee had spent $76 million on lawyers even before going to trial in the civil suit, and Commissioner Cox and Chairman Reuter decided that the Commission couldn't devote the extensive resources that enforcement in this complicated case would require. So it's my view, Mr. Chairman, that there's an important lesson in the Whoops case, and that is that if you're going to mess up, mess up big, because the fact of the matter is that the SEC just doesn't have the resources to go after these major cases. And I think all of us would agree that that's unacceptable. We certainly wouldn't treat ordinary crimes uh, this way. We wouldn't say in our society, don't prosecute murderers because it costs too much and instead go after jaywalkers uh, because you can get your numbers up and none of us would take that kind of approach in the general uh, law enforcement area. Last point I wanted to mention, Mr. Chairman, deals with this proposal for self-funding of the Securities and Exchange Commission. I think that it's got potential, but what concerns me is it lacks certainty. Maybe the cookie jar is going to be full, maybe it's going to be partially full, but that's not good enough. It's not good enough to have that kind of uncertainty if we're going to attract top quality people in the future. So I would hope that we look also at other areas, particularly this concept of disgorgement, where you take the funds generated by fraud actions, there were $76 million uh, in fiscal year 1987 that uh, were generated that way, and I would hope that we would look at that and other concepts. Last point I wanted to mention, Mr. Chairman, is uh, the President-elect, Mr. Bush, has said, and we all support it, that we want to have a government that's kinder and gentler. Well, I just hope we won't apply that principle to the suppression of fraud and the enforcement work at the Securities and Exchange Commission, because I think there's an area where we need some hard-nosed work, and you've been the leader in this effort, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to working with you. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, gentlemen. Gentlemen from Ohio, Mr. Axel. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, too, would like to welcome uh, Chairman Reuter uh, to this hearing and commend the Chair as well for the timeliness of it. But despite the fact that it's close to the holidays, this is a very important issue, and uh, we're pleased that uh, so many members could attend as well as uh, the Chairman. Uh, this indeed is a uh, perhaps a, uh, a new uh, ball game. Uh, since I came to Congress in 1981, the number of shares traded on the New York Stock Exchange has increased 186 percent. There have been a prolif proliferation of new trading strategies using new derivative products. Securities trading is now international. Uh, many times we have people come into this very committee and talk about a level playing field. I would suggest, and Mr. Chairman, you know better than most, that not only do we have a, perhaps a level playing field, but we've got a new playing field, indeed a new stadium. Uh, since that time, and uh, indeed we have to uh, react uh, accordingly, uh, as our colleagues have said. But at the same time, uh, Congress has increased the SEC's, bu SEC's budget uh, only modestly in fiscal year 1989. Uh, the SEC submitted, uh, with presidential approval, a budget request of $160.9 million, uh, but the Congress saw fit to only appropriate $142.5 million. While this amount constitutes an increase of over the, uh, the Commission's existing budget, it may barely cover statutorily required staff raises and other basic expenses. In short, the SEC is being asked to do too much with too little. The SEC has done a remarkable job of doing more with less. Between 1981 and 1986, the SEC increased its broker-dealer registrations by 73 percent, but during the same time, the number of registered broker-dealers increased by 57 percent. Productivity increases can improve performance only with certain limits. Beyond that point, regulatory responsibilities can fall through the cracks, as we've seen. What is even more ironic is that the SEC operates at a substantial profit. The Commission's self-funding study uh, notes that between 1980 and 1989, the SEC's budget increased 97 percent, but its filing fees increased a whopping 413 percent. In short, the Commission generates more than enough funds to operate, but Congress doesn't let the Commission keep one penny of its revenue. The adequacy of the Commission's resources has been a matter of serious concern to us for quite some time. The uh, Republican Securities Trading Reform Act of 1987, 1987 H.R. 2668, introduced by our friend Norm Land, of which I am a co-sponsor, included a three-year authorization for the Commission at the funding levels that the SEC requested. As a result of strong bipartisan cooperation within this committee, we approved a two-year authorization bill that the President signed just last year. In addition, I have been a strong advocate for adequate, adequate appropriations for the SEC. For example, last June we went to the House floor and urged that the SEC's appropriation be increased above the $135 million uh, provided in the House bill. We asked the House Appropriations Committee to work with the Senate to increase the Commission's bu budget, and they did so. Last June, we also suggested on the House floor that we should consider modifying the funding mechanism for the SEC and explore the concept of self-funding. Hal Rogers, ranking Republican on the Commerce uh, State Subcommittee, indicated that he thought the idea had merit. For these reasons, I am pleased that Chairman Regal of Michigan requested that the Commission prepare for, self, for a self-funding study, and I commend Chairman Dingell uh, for his convening this hearing to examine the self-funding alternatives. In addition, I want to briefly raise a matter of considerable importance, the funding of the special study. Recently, President Reagan signed into law the Insider Trading and Securities Fraud Enforcement Act of 1988, for which many members of this subcommittee had a great deal to do with. Uh, Mr. Rinaldo <coughs> um, urged that uh, the act uh, include a requirement that the SEC undertake a special study of the securities market similar to the 1963 special study. However, the Commission may not commence the study unless Congress earmarks $5 million in appropriations for that purpose. I believe that the special study is critical to developing a long-term plan for regulating our securities markets. Accordingly, I believe that any increased SEC budget or self-funding plan must include money for that special study. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I again uh, commend you for this uh, a timely hearing and uh, yield back the balance of my time. Chair commends the gentleman and chair notes that uh, it wasn't the members of this subcommittee who had a great deal to do with it. It was this committee and the members of this committee whose actions made possible the enactment of the insider trading legislation not once but twice. 
And under those two statutes, many wrongdoers are now headed for a period of tranquil repose in appropriate federal establishments. And we hope to increase their numbers by seeing to it that the SEC has the resources needed to carry out its functions. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cooper. I thank the chair. I'd always heard that this was a hard working committee, and I'm glad to see proof positive of this during these Christmas hearings. This is an important topic, and I appreciate the chair's dealing, diligence and hard work in calling this hearing. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, Mr. Kundal, we welcome you this morning for your statement. Chair notes, as you both know, gentlemen, that it is the practice of this committee that all witnesses who appear before the committee appear under oath. Do either of you object to appearing under oath? We do not. Uh, gentlemen, for your information, copies of the rules of the committee and rules of the subcommittee are there at the table to inform you of the extent of your rights and the limitations on the powers of the committee. Gentlemen, do either of you desire to be advised by counsel during the time of your appearance here this morning? I do not. Uh, gentlemen, the chair informs you this is not in any way an adversarial hearing, as you are very well aware. Uh, it is just the practice of this committee to keep these approaches to appearance by witnesses intact in order that we might have less questions when we do choose to swear potentially recalcitrant or difficult persons as they appear before the committee. Gentlemen, if you then have no objection to appearing under oath, if you would each please rise and raise your right hand. Gentlemen, do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you guide? Yeah. Gentlemen, you may each consider yourself to be under oath, and if you will please um, proceed uh, your testimony by identifying yourself. The uh, chair will recognize you in such order as you choose for the presentation of your statements. I will begin, sir. You may indeed, Mr. Ritter. Um, I am uh, David Ruder, chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission. I am pleased to be here before this subcommittee to present the findings and recommendations from the self-funding study prepared by the executive by the Office of the Executive Director, Mr. George Cundell, who is here with us today, and I'd like to compliment him and his staff um, on the uh, excellence with which they worked in preparing this study under uh, fairly severe time constraints. Uh, the study, I request that the study uh, entitled Self-Funding Study of the United States Securities and Exchange Commission dated December 20, 1988, and previously submitted to the subcommittee be included in the record. John, who wants it in the record? Without, without objection, the study will be reviewed and appropriate portions will be inserted in the record appropriate places. This, uh, my opening remarks, uh, which I had prepared, were uh, uh, subsumed in large part by the uh, opening statements of the committee members, so I will uh, uh, abbreviate what I had intended to say and uh, give you some highlights. Um, uh, I do appreciate uh, the opportunity to uh, testify on this subject. And I appreciate the fact that there's interest shown uh, not only uh, by Senator Donald, Donald Regal, who directed the study uh, in, the, in, in last year, but by uh, Chairman Dingell and other members of the committee. It, it is, it is uh, uh, wonderful for us to have support for this concept from uh, both sides uh, of Congress. Uh, today, the Commission faces challenges like, unlike it has seen in the 54 years of its history. Um, uh, some of those challenges have been um, stated here, and I, I look at the automation of the coming automation of the markets, uh, the increasingly complex uh, international area as two aspects of our work which are going to grow uh, in the future. I call to your attention the fact that we have just uh, published uh, a policy statement of the U.S. The Securities and Exchange Commission regulation of the uh, international securities markets, uh, giving, I think, ample indication of the Commission's interest uh, and desire to exercise a leadership uh, role in that area. Uh, the challenges that we have stem from a complex securities world, and a world which will continue to develop in an explosive manner. I use the word explosive deliberately because it it is my assessment that if changes in the levels and manner of funding for the Securities and Exchange Commission are not improved, we will soon be facing the new world of the 1990s with an agency whose resources are still at the levels of the 1970s. We will be fighting the next conflict with yesterday's weapons. When I speak in terms of conflict and weapons, 
I describe an agency whose function is to act as policemen for the securities market, yet the agency's police, police function is unique for it is charged not only with protecting investors, but also with understanding and facilitating the function, functioning of our nation's securities market. We operate with four uh, major divisions, the Division of Corporation Finance, the Division of Market Regulation, the Division of Investment Management, and the Division of Enforcement. These divisions have, as the opening statements have indicated, uh, been operating with a virtual uh, zero growth uh, since uh, in the last decade. Uh, if one compares uh, some of the figures uh, of their responsibility in comparison to their uh, staffing, one can get an idea of the, of the changes which have occurred during the period from 1980 to 1989. Uh, with the Division of Corporation for, for ans, for, Finance, for instance, we've had an increase in new registration statements filed annually from 710 to 1,700, and a concomitant increase in other areas. Nevertheless, during this period, we will have no increase uh, in the staff uh, of the Disclosure Division. With, our rega with regard to our uh, Division of, of uh, Market Regulation, We've seen a 76% increase in the number of registered broker-dealer firms from 6,750 to 11,900, a 145% increase in the number of uh, securities de dealers registered, registered reps from 196,000 to 480,000, and a 199% increase in the number of branch offices. During this same period, the staff of, the, of our market regulation staff will have decreased by 2%. Investment management is charged with, uh, uh, with uh, regulation of investment companies and investment advisors. During this period, we've seen a, a 146% increase in the number of registered investment companies from 1,461 to 3,600, 3, and a 217% increase in the number of registered investment advisors from 4,580 to 14,500. And yet during this period, our staff increases have been uh, only uh, 13%. Uh, uh, overall, uh, the uh, commission staff uh, has, uh, has grown uh, very little in the last, uh, uh, in the last years. Uh, we've grown from uh, 2,041 in 1980 to 2,131 authorized for 1989. Um, the area of, uh, of uh, uh, suppression of fraud, the enforcement division, is a very hard, issue, a very hard area to uh, quantify, but I think it's very clear, uh, it has been pointed out in the opening statements, that we are addressing an increasingly complex environment we are facing an increasing litigious securities bar. We are facing um, a mammoth cases. Um, and I, I, I do agree that the whoops matter was one which, which uh, uh, on balance, uh, the final decision was caused uh, in major part because of the uh, decision that we could not allocate resources to the enforcement of that in that area. We nevertheless have allocated, as you know, uh, significant resources to the major investigation of uh, uh, the Drexel Burnham Lambert, uh, and we're prepared uh, to move forward uh, vigorously in that area. Uh, we also have an allocation of resources which includes currently a major uh, attack on penny stock fraud. It's an area that we think needs growing resources and which we're looking at uh, uh, in great detail uh, now. Um, as has been pointed out, again, I, it should be noted that our budget has increased during the last nine years from 72 million to approximately 142 million. But in my view, this, uh, this increase is largely uh, inflation uh, driven. Now, by using these figures, I do not mean to criticize the dedication and effectiveness of the Commission staff nor do I mean to second guess a general budgetary policy in the United States recognizing the need to reduce expenditures. What I do mean to say is that the Commission is currently operating at full capacity at a time when it needs new resources to cope with an increasingly complex national and international market 
environment. But the total resources are not the only dimension of this problem. And I must call attention to the subcommittee that we are face, facing dramatic difficulty in hiring and retaining uh, the best staff at the commission. The fact is that the Securities and Exchange Commission commit, commits for personnel with the securities industry, which pays, uh, some say, outlandish salaries, and with the securities bar, which pays, some say, high salaries. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we find that uh, we have in our, in our agency 36% uh, of our total staff, or some 760 lawyers, uh, who are, uh, with whom we must compete uh, with, uh, uh, with, uh, with, other, uh, with other areas uh, uh, in the private sector and even in the government uh, area. With regard to this, uh, the, the uh, starting salaries, the figures are simply uh, dramatic. Uh, uh, we can offer a GS-11 starting salary to attorneys out of law school paying $27,716. At the same time, the, those people who are capable SEC lawyers uh, will be offered $57,000 in Washington, D.C., or in Chicago, uh, uh, $62,000 in Los Angeles, or $71,000 in New York, sometimes even higher than that. Uh, we find that the starting salary problem is one which uh, causes us great uh, uh, difficulty. Uh, we not only compete in the starting salary uh, area, but uh, we have to compete in the advancement part of this, and, and this is true not only with attorneys, but in other areas of commission staff, as is indicated in our, uh, in our uh, report. We have a very severe turnover problem. Uh, the average length of stay for a commission attorney is three years. Uh, our accountants stay with us for something like eight or nine years, uh, and all of them leave uh, for dramatic uh, uh, salary uh, increases. Now, there's one other area of a concern to us, and that is uh, the question of space management. Uh, we are an agency with a very high, highly professionalized staff, uh, and the government-wide space uh, allocations uh, assume uh, a, a large, much larger percentage of non-professional staff, or we think. Uh, and we find that, uh, that our attorneys are doubled up in uh, offices now, which are, which are 135 square feet, uh, and in those offices, uh, we have to put in our, uh, the litigation files and other materials which attorneys uh, rely upon. They don't have uh, privacy for, uh, uh, for discussions or telephone conversations, uh, and it is a working environment which is certainly not competitive and uh, one which we find uh, is very unhappy. Now, the question of what to do about this uh, has been uh, on, on our minds for some years. Uh, and in response, uh, in response to the Senate Securities uh, uh, Subcommittee's request, the officer, officer, the executive director of the commission has prepared the self-funding study which is uh, in your hands today. That study addresses two areas. First, it suggests ways to address salary differentials between the commission and the private sector uh, ad and also addresses uh, the space management problems. Second, it provides several ways in which the Commission might receive the benefits of government revenues which are related to its activities with a goal of increasing overall Commission uh, resources. I may say that this, um, uh, this study has been prepared by the Office of our Executive Director. Uh, it has not yet been uh, approved by our Commissioners, uh, but I endorse its contents and I will work to act actively to obtain uh, a commission endorsement and will be presenting, I hope, uh, legislation to the Congress uh, to implement uh, the recommendations which are in that study. Uh, the staff suggests uh, that the commission be granted special salary authority in four areas. Uh, this is salary authority which would allow us to av avoid the restrictions of the Office of Personnel Management with regard to salary payments, but not with regard to disciplinary matters benefits uh, and other aspects uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the OPM regulations. It suggests authority first to set salaries that would take into account competitive salary differentials and would pr provide for regional pay differentials. We just have a dreadful time in New York uh, and Los Angeles in hiring people 
Uh, we can't. Uh, we can't even compete with the. Um, uh, we can't even com compete with the state district attorney offices uh, in New York City, much less with the uh, with the with the private bar. Uh, we can't compete for our examiners uh, with the broker dealer firms who hire them away constantly, or with the investment companies who hire them away constantly. I can't. I can't say that we're ever going to be equal, uh, but we certainly need to try to reduce. Uh, the pay differential so, that, so as to uh, be able to uh, operate in that very high cost area. Uh, the second area uh, is, an, is a suggestion that we be allowed to offer retention bonuses to professional staff members based upon performance. Third, that we be given uh, the opportunity to fill 100 positions at compensations uh, at the executive pay scale for highly qualified lawyers, accountants, and other professionals. And fourth, we, we urge the opportunity to make raises in so-called pay bans so that we're not constricted by that, uh, those developments. Other federal agencies have these powers, particularly those in the financial regulatory area. The study addresses a second area, and that is funding options by which we may pay for increases in our resources and for urgently needed personnel and non-personnel initiatives. We recognize that personnel the personnel initiatives that we su we're suggesting will be costly. The first funding option would be a continuation of current OMB and congressional oversight of the Commission's budget. I would describe this as a wish op option. We would like very much to have the Congress provide to us the funding we think is necessary and have that funding be provided under, under current uh, budgetary uh, pr procedures. But we find that our budget is less than 1% of the budget which, our, which the subcommittee of the Appropriations Committee deals with uh, when, it, when it makes its final decisions and that there, it's simply not paying the kind of attention to our needs that we think is necessary. Consequently, we are suggesting two other options. The second option seeks to, ob to obtain, maintain OMB and congressional oversight but would remove the Securities and Exchange Commission from dependence on, 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 uh, the, on the, the budgetary process itself in, in certain respects and would allow the Commission to offset its spending with fee collections. Uh, the third funding option would remove this SEC entirely from the appropriations process. SEC fee collections would be used to establish a permanent trust revolving fund. Uh, we would still be subject to oversight by the Congressional Authorization Committees, but not um, formally within the uh, appropriations process um, other than that. Uh, we, we are, in the staff study, presents these three options as options. Uh, our objective uh, is not to be uh, relieved from oversight, uh, but to be put into a position where we can accomplish our statutory objectives uh, in the future uh, with, uh, uh, with the kind of flexibility we think is important. Thank you. That concludes my opening statement. Mr. Reuter, thank you. Mr. Kundal, did you have an opening statement you wanted to make? No, I did not. All right. We will proceed uh, then with uh, the questions of the members. And uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for a very comprehensive statement, and we uh, appreciate it very much. Now, the Exchange Commission recently filed a 184-page complaint against Drexel and others alleging numerous violations of the securities laws, including, including fraud. It's been reported that by October, with the SEC trial not yet begun, Drexel had already spent $75 million in legal fees and close to $70 million in public relations and advertising to overcome the SEC's charges. Now, these expenditures by Drexel alone amount to more than the SEC's entire annual appropriation. It's been reported that Drexel has at least 115 lawyers in its defense against a group of 15 SEC lawyers. And although the judge prevented it, Drexel lawyers tried to schedule 41 pretrial interviews with witnesses in five different cities all on the same day. Obviously an impossible challenge for the SEC to meet. Could you explain, first of all, Chairman Reuter, how we should expect the SEC, with its resources, to competently and successfully 
pursue a matter of the size and complexity of the Drexel case given the level of resources that Drexel is out there expending on its defense? I certainly can. Uh, we have uh, 650 lawyers in our enforcement division. Um, approximately 450 of those are located in, the, in, the, in Washington, D.C., and the others are spread uh, throughout the country. Um, we are prepared to, to devote whatever proportion of our resources uh, that is necessary to, pr to pursue uh, this, this Drexel matter. Uh, we believe that our case is strong, and we know it is a detailed and difficult case, and so uh, we, are, we are dedicated uh, to fighting this case, and we also, I may say, have other cases which are large, not quite as complicated, which we are pursuing. Uh, I think you should note uh, that, the, that there's something to be said about the numbers. Uh, I've computed the hourly uh, wages of our attorneys, and there's something like $25 an hour, uh, I'm sure the Drexel lawyers are making significantly more than that, so that if you're going to do gross numbers, I suspect that we are the most efficient uh, group of lawyers that Drexel will be facing. Uh, uh, we, we, uh, um, we, we do have not only the 15 uh, or so lawyers who are in the team that's assigned to that uh, litigation, but we have the resources of the rest of the agency. And I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'm confident we'll pursue the Drexel matter. What I do have to tell you, however, is that, uh, that pursuing Drexel will divert resources uh, from other areas of the enforcement operation. One of the things that's long troubled me as we've looked at this underfunding situation is that there seems that there are powerful forces and obvious pressures on the commission to possibly settle on less than favorable terms in a case like Drexel because that way you conserve resources that you would expend on a uh, complete litigation process. Do you think we ought to be concerned about those kinds of pressures, those kinds of settlement pressures given this uh, resources situation? Uh, one can always be concerned about pressures to settle because of resources matters. It's not, however, unique to, uh, uh, to a public agency. It's, it's a pressure which exists in the private area as well. Uh, we do not, at least in my experience, uh, settle cases where we think that we will be successful at trial uh, merely to save our resources. Uh, we, will, we will sometimes uh, uh, settle cases when we're not quite certain about our success. Uh, I, I mean settle at a, at a level that might seem to be lower than one would want. Uh, but uh, when we settle cases uh, where we seem not to be doing as well as we could, my view, we are either uh, settling a case in which we believe the outcome is uncertain, uh, or we are uh, uh, settling a case in which we're going to get cooperation from some of the witnesses so that we can pursue other leads. Well, the math is pretty easy, and Drexel is putting resources into this that amount to your whole budget. Given that they're doing that, and given that you have said you are going to pursue this vigorously, does the budget situation then put pressure on settling other cases at less than favorable terms because you have to put all your resources on dealing with the major case, say, Drexel? Uh, I, I can't uh, uh, give you chapter and verse on the on the on the enforcement uh, all the enforcement policies at our agency because I don't on a day-to-day -day basis uh, deal with uh, uh, those decisions. But at least in my experience at the table, that is uh, when we do when we do engage in settlement, as I've indicated, uh, the resource allocation prop problem is not a major factor in the settlement. Where it is a major factor is in the decision to prosecute and the decision to bring cases. Here, I think it's fair to say that we have uh, evidence of cases which we could bring but don't because we don't have the resources to do it. Could you tell us about some of those cases? Could you name some? Well, I can't give them, I can't give you, um, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not allowed by my, by my staff to give you names of cases, but I can give you a generic area which I spoke about in my opening testimony uh, we are facing uh, a, an area of penny stock fraud in this country in which 
um, in which investors are simply being uh, gypped by a great number of boiler room operations uh, in circumstances in which those activities are are uh, moving out of the area that they used to be centered in geographically and moving all over the country. Uh, this is uh, an area which we are attacking vigorously, but we simply don't have uh, the resources to bring all of the cases against all of the broker-dealer firms that we believe are engaged in, in activity that should be stopped. Well, how many more of the cases are there like whoops? I mean, there was a closed case, so we're not talking about uh, a pending situation. How many more were there like that that prevented you from uh, going forward for lack of resources? Whoops was unique in the in the in its uh, in its complexity in its complexity and uh, and size. Uh, I there isn't another case like whoops which uh, uh, which we have not brought. Well, it, it did happen in the New York City case as well, the New York City bond failure. That was another case, wasn't it, was it not? Well, I guess I have to talk about recent memory. Uh, I don't uh, know whether the decision uh, not to bring an action uh, in New York was a resource question or not. That was in the 1970s, as you know. Let me ask you about just uh, one other area, the question of the leveraged uh, buyouts. As a consequence of the uh, increased uh, prevalence of these uh, huge leverage buyouts, a number of approaches have been suggested in the securities law area to curtail these activities, including placing restriction on tender offers, expanding protections for existing stockholders and bondholders, and requiring the SEC to review all transactions over a certain size for their potential impact on the companies involved in the overall economy. Given the current level of resources available to the Commission, what would be your ability to take on any new regulatory responsibilities to deal with this massive uh, leverage buyout phenomenon? Well, if we were required to engage in additional uh, disclosure review activities uh, uh, with, with regard to these major activity, uh, these major uh, buyouts, or if you were, if we were to have other kinds of uh, time-consuming time uh, regulations imposed upon us, we would either have to have new staff, or we would have to decrease uh, activity in other areas. Uh, that the, the burden of that activity would fall primarily upon our uh, division of corporation finance, the full disclosure uh, uh, division, and that would mean that we would review fewer uh, uh, annual reports. Uh, uh, perhaps and uh, re review perhaps fewer initial public offering documents if we were forced to shift resources. In the study, you state that leverage buyouts present great risk to investors and may involve significant conflicts of interest. Could you tell the subcommittee what uh, you see as the greatest risks and what the nature of these conflicts of interest are? Uh, uh, Congressman Wyden, I, uh, I am scheduled to testify uh, uh, next uh, uh, Thursday on this subject, so I'll give here, you a... We have you here today. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a, <laughs> a preview. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 risks, the risks are, uh, are primarily, uh, from our point of view, in the disclosure area. The question is whether or not the disclosures to shareholders when these activities take place are adequate. Uh, the second level uh, of risk is uh, whether the disclosures to uh, uh, the bondholders of the companies who are buying uh, uh, bonds uh, are adequate at the time these bonds are purchased. Uh, with regard to conflict of interest, uh, there is a potential for conflicts to exist, but uh, that is an area which has been delegated uh, not delegated, but which has been a, a matter of state uh, law, and uh, we follow that carefully and believe that the uh, conflict area is one which is currently being handled quite, quite well by the states. My time has expired and the chairman has, uh, has returned. Uh, uh, I think a gentleman uh, from New York uh, was next, uh, Mr. Lamb. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chairman. The, uh, Chairman Ruder, the, yes, the self-funding study cites uh, statistics, which we've discussed already, showing that regulated activities have increased very dramatically, in some cases by hundreds of uh, percentage points. 
while the staff levels down at SEC have remained basically static. Uh, yet, the study, as I uh, look at it, doesn't seem to discuss the need for increasing your staffing levels. Rather, the study seems to suggest that inc the increased funding be used for improving uh, staff salaries and the overall staff environment. Uh, my question then is, are these kind of improvements, increasing the environment, increasing salaries, more important than increasing the numbers employed by the SEC? If, if you were able to retain staff longer by offering higher salaries and better benefits, would that possibly alleviate the need for more staff? The opinion of the division directors uh, at the commission is that th that utilizing increased salaries would be the most efficient way at this point of meeting our resource needs. Uh, I have some slight disagreement with them. I, th I think that we need as well to increase the numbers of people at the commission. And our budget, uh, the presidential has been pointed out, the presidential budget uh, which was submitted had a very a, a very sound increase uh, in uh, program staff uh, for the fiscal 89 which was not given to us uh, an increase which I think is essential uh, for the agency to prosper we, we seem to be focusing so much on uh, the problem with attorneys and uh, the SEC lawyers and their salaries uh, and their numbers up against uh, Drexel Burnham's salaries and the numbers of the attorneys they're able to put into the field. I notice uh, that in the secretarial higher uh, private sector salaries are largely responsible for a 40% annual turnover rate in secretaries. I think it's higher than that, isn't it, George? 40% uh, was the, uh, was the, the rate year. last year. Yeah. 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 That's I, our worst problem in terms of turnover. Yes. Well, it would seem that here are, here are these lawyers underpaid, uh, up against highly paid uh, law firms and lawyers hired by the Drexel Burnham people, and then they, every time they turn around, they have a new uh, a new secretary with a 40 percent uh, annual turnover rate. I think uh, our lawyers right now are uh, are expressing preferences uh, for uh, their own personal computers uh, as a way of meeting their secretarial needs rather than uh, than having to deal with the turnover problems we have. I see. Well, some of the remedies that you suggest in this study w really seem to challenge uh, existing civil service uh, law in many regards. You you're aware of that, and you're aware of what a uh, hornet's nest we you're are. walking into when you start tampering with uh, civil service. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, uh, if you have so much trouble filling these computer specialist positions, can you, uh, have you tried and do you think you can get OPM to reclassify the positions? Perhaps George Kundal can respond to that better than I. One, one of the problems we have is that as a small agency, our computer complex is not as large as it is at, at cabinet level agency. So when you apply the uh, government-wide classification standards to computer specialists, our uh, positions don't grade as high as larger agencies. We uh, top out as a journeyman at a journeyman grade of GS-12, whereas in some of the larger agencies, uh, GS-13 would be the journeyman grade. So we often find ourselves in a position of, uh, of training specialists who in turn move to other government agencies. But I think as you're all aware, our problem isn't so much in competition with other agencies as it is competition with the private sector. Government salaries for computer uh, folks are um, just not competitive which, with what's being paid on the outside. And I think that is the uh, one discipline that's the most difficult for us to attract into government, even more difficult than attorneys or accountants. Uh, I, I may make one other comment. Uh, we have had a very fine cooperation from the Office of Personnel Management. We have no, uh, we have no complaint about the way they have attempted to respond uh, uh, to our needs. Uh, they have given us uh, 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 hiring authority and they do cooperate with us to try to find us, to, to get us into classification ways that can help us. But the problem that you're uh, emphasizing here, the, uh, the discrepancy between the private salary for a securities lawyer and the government salary, uh, I, I wonder if that problem is any greater 
than is the problem that exists uh, down at the IRS as between uh, tax lawyers on the outside of the IRS and tax lawyers inside of the IRS or any greater than it is down at the Justice Department with uh, antitrust lawyers uh, being paid at government rates versus antitrust lawyers being paid outside or down at the Federal Trade Commission uh, or, any, or, or a number of other uh, of the agencies where there is this tremendous discrepancy uh, if, if uh, we were to, uh, if the Congress were to follow some of these recommendations and uh, dismantle traditional civil service procedures vis-a-vis -vis the SEC, we might really be opening uh, the door to uh, a more government-wide attack on uh, civil service. Not that I would be against that. Well, I, I, we, I we understand that we understand that, understand that problem and have been very sensitive to it. Uh, one of the reasons that our suggestions um, um, are, we have more than one suggestion, uh, ways of dealing with the pay problems, is that we've made some study about what what has been allowed for other agencies. Uh, our our uh, uh, comparison, interestingly, is uh, although we do emphasize the role of attorneys, it should be recognized that we all have always we are we also have economists and, and accountants and financial examiners, and. Uh, I think that our role can be compared it to some large extent to the financial services regulatory agencies. And in the, in the banking area, uh, Congress has long uh, recognized the need uh, for uh, pay differentials in order to provide the opportunity to obtain uh, um, uh, a better people. And uh, uh, we've, we have found, at least my experience in the last year, has been that we are much more involved in the financial regulatory area uh, than has been the case in the past. And even if you notice our Drexel Burnham case, we are heavily involved in a highly technical uh, uh, regulatory area, uh, which, which I think does justify uh, uh, pay scales which are different than some other agencies. I thank you. My time is up, Mr. Chairman. I thank you. Time of the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from Tennessee. I thank the chair. I'd like to examine the disgorgement situation. It's my understanding that for the last several years, the SEC has uh, retrieved a great deal of money from uh, various malefactors in, in the form of disgorgements. Could you tell me about how much money that has been for the last couple of years? Well, it's, there, are two, there are two aspects of the um, uh, of the of the recovery, disgorgement actually refers to the amounts which are, are recovered from wrongdoers and are measured by their profits, if you will, from their wrongdoing. We also have the Insider Trading Sanctions Act, which in, in effect is a civil penalty. Uh, and uh, some, of our, our, uh, some of the amounts which we have recovered come from that, uh, from that act. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know that during the year in which uh, uh, Mr. Boski's uh, um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, disgorgements uh, in '87 were uh, 14 million, uh, but the year before that they were they were in the 60s, 60 million. And uh, uh, the year that Mr. Boski's settlement came, uh, we had something in the 100 and f 115 million total disgorgement and uh, and penalty area. I should say that is the, the positions the. The Commission's position that the disgorgement amounts uh, should be available to investors, uh, the people who against whom there was wrongdoing. We believe those amounts should be should be kept in a constructive trust and available to the investors. And we would not suggest uh, that those uh, funds be made available uh, to the Commission. So you do not feel that even a portion of those funds should perhaps be made available to the Commission? for use in funding its own operations. You feel that that's the investor's money? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, I might feel, uh, uh, with regard to the, even the penalties, um, we have not urged uh, that the penalties come to the commission. Uh, I think that has been f uh, based upon two uh, aspects. Uh, one is that the fees which the commission generates are are uh, very substantial compared to our budget. and, and uh, 
we simply at this point don't need to look to other sources if, if, if the principle is established. And secondly, there is some feeling that, the, that a policy in which an agent, agency may seek to become funded through use of its enforcement apparatus might be one which would be challengeable, that, mm -hmm. that, that we really ought to avoid the appearance of attempting to bring an enforcement action in order to generate revenue for our own purposes. So we have avoided uh, those suggestions in both, both the disgorgement and the penalty session. I guess that may be referred to as the speed trap problem, in a, in a sense. <laughs> I guess that's right. Is there any way to project fees uh, in the out years or disgorgements, or is that something that is impossible to predict? Well, that depends upon the, uh, uh, up, upon the kinds of cases that we have. You may know that we have uh, 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 frozen substantial assets of Mr. Wang and our, uh, uh, Mr. Lee and our Wang and Lee litigation in the, in the uh, 15 to 20 million dollar uh, area, at least according to our, uh, our complaint. Mm -hmm. And uh, that kind of case will come along occasionally, but we can't tell uh, what the level will be from year to year. So it's a very, un if, if we had it as a, as a funding source, it would be a very uncertain uh, kind of funding source. I would look much more to the fee revenues, which uh, as uh, you may know, uh, in 1988 uh, uh, were $248 million, and, uh, uh, which are uh, uh, projected in 89 to be approximately the same level. Mm -hmm. It's against our budget now of $142 million. My colleague, Mr. Lent, was asking questions about ways that we could differentiate the SEC from other agencies so that we could draw fair lines among agencies. And you were making the case that you're much more like a banking regulatory agency and therefore should be able to come closer to fair market wages for your people than perhaps other agencies of government. I'd like to explore that uh, line of reasoning a little bit. It seems to me that we have a number of other competing agencies like the Drug Enforcement Administration the Federal Communications Commission, and perhaps others that uh, have a very, very important enforcement role. And it seems to me that we're going to have to draw fair lines. Can you give us a, a rationale for distinguishing the SEC from, from other agencies? Well, I, I haven't done the study statistically, but the rationale that I would offer is to look at the places uh, uh, that and the salaries obtained by people who leave the agency, uh, we find that when our attorneys leave the SEC, they go to securities law firms. Uh, I don't know where others go when they leave, but we find that they, when they leave us, if they're making uh, $45,000 uh, uh, or, or $50,000, they will go uh, and make uh, well over $100,000 uh, in their new employment. And uh, I, I just don't know what the kinds of comparisons are in drug enforcement or, uh, or other areas. My, uh, so uh, that, that's the approach that we've taken and that we do think it, that uh, if such a study were, take, were shown, it would still reveal that we have the worst competitive market uh, probably of, of any agency with regard to ability to retain uh, attorneys. But might I add to that, I think it's also a problem with personnel coming in the other direction. If we're looking for mid-level managers or someone to head a, a regional office or a, or a division of the commission, it's very difficult to compete and attract someone from the private sector into these positions. They have to give up large uh, amounts of income to come into the federal government. And one of the proposals we've, we've suggested uh, would, would try to allow us to be more competitive by having 100 positions set aside where we could hopefully be, uh, pay higher salaries so that when a matter such as the uh, Drexel case appears and we're looking for litigators or looking for seasoned attorneys with securities experience, we can go out and attract them. Right now, that's al almost impossible to do. As someone who's worked for brief periods of time in three private law firms, each of which had a significant securities practice, I can uh, support what you're saying about the difficulty in attracting new people and also mid-level people and the pressure on current employees to leave for much better paying jobs in the same same field. I have no further questions at this time, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Distinguished gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Drexel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Ruder, if I could just return briefly to the Drexel case. 
The uh, Washington Post reported this morning that negotiations had uh, broken down uh, in that case. Uh, the Wall Street Journal was less ominous and indicated uh, in a, a story uh, somewhere in the middle of the paper that uh, there was no progress. Uh, could you uh, share some uh, information with us uh, to the extent that you can in regard to the uh, negotiations that are currently uh, taking place with the uh, Drexel people? I, I guess uh, I, all I can say to you is that uh, my interest in the settlement negotiations are probably as high as anyone in the countries, uh, but I am not allowed to share uh, information which I may have regarding the status of those negotiations um, uh, as a matter of our enforcement uh, uh, policy. The, um, I kind of expected that answer, but I thought I'd ask it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you could be joined by this whole group of reporters here that <laughs> ask me that same question whenever possible. <laughs> Well, could you tell us whether the Post or the uh, Wall Street Journal was closer to the truth? No. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't touch that right. for anything. <laughs> that, was a, that was a gratuitous question. Uh, let me ask you if I could pursue a little bit uh, where uh, my friend from Tennessee uh, uh, ended uh, in regard to uh, perhaps precedent setting if we are to, let's say, uh, go with the number three option, which would, uh, under the, the study, the funding study, would set up a trust uh, revolving fund uh, that would not be subject to the appropriations process. That would be perhaps the most controversial, I suspect, uh, at least on the Hill, uh, because uh, our friends on the Appropriations Committee may look, uh, uh, look with some uh, uh, temerity on uh, whether, in fact, they want to uh, go that route. But let me, if I could, pursue that. If we were to look at that uh, route, uh, where, where would we be then with uh, precedent setting for other agencies, uh, FBI, which has continually over the years returned more than the, their budget, uh, DEA, which I suspect has done. The reason I raise that is that uh, there is some attraction in, um, in funding the enforcement procedures of various agencies with the um, money from uh, those who are being investigated or, or being regulated. Um, that is attractive. I just came back from Mexico City with the uh, Narcotics Committee. Uh, we met the new uh, Attorney General in the Justice Building that had been totally built and funded with money that was uh, taken from uh, an asset seized from drug dealers. Uh, their entire Justice Building is paid for, beautiful building, uh, paid for by assets seized by uh, the, uh, the Department of Justice uh, from the bad guys. Um, I guess that my question is, uh, what kind of a precedent do we set and what are the downsides of that, uh, of that concept? Do we, in fact, encourage uh, overzealous, uh, if not regulation, uh, perhaps prosecution in those areas? And uh, should we be somewhat careful about the way that we proceed, uh, particularly with the third option? Well, I, I do agree that uh, that the third option is the is the most uh, uh, controversial. As far as we're concerned, uh, our approach has been not to seek uh, funding from um, uh, from enforcement activities, but uh, based upon the fees which are levied uh, uh, by by statute already. We have uh, really three sources. Uh, one are the registration fees uh, for securities offerings. Uh, another. Uh, the registration, uh, our transfer fees in the, in the stock markets, and the third, in interestingly enough, are uh, our registration fees related to takeovers. Uh, and in those three areas, uh, we, we, we won't control, we won't control the level of the fees. The fees will be controlled uh, by outside forces. So in that sense, I don't think we would be providing a, the, uh, the precedent for an enforcement uh, related uh, uh, fee generation. And on the other hand, I don't mean to take a position that that wouldn't be appropriate uh, in some cases for some agencies uh, uh, as a means uh, of, uh, uh, of self-funding. It, it may very well be, may be that, the, uh, uh, that, the, that the level of income generated from such uh, measures is so large uh, that the agency would automatically uh, produce uh, resources no matter no matter uh, what kind of decisions it made in its enforcement policies. Might, might I answer the question quickly in, in a slightly different way? 
there's not an option presented in this report that is not without precedent somewhere else in the federal government. Uh, I think the most important precedent to cite is the one the Congress uh, enacted in New York for the FBI, where they were experiencing a 3.5 percent a year turnover rate, and the uh, the Congress passed and the President signed into law a bill that uh, would provide a 25 percent salary boost for uh, FBI employees in the New York area. Uh, that's again based on a 3.45 percent turnover rate. Our agency turnover rate across the board is 15 percent. As Mr. Lent has pointed out, in some occupational specialties it goes as high as 40 percent. Uh, we would like some kind of special treatment to, to contain this, this turnover rate, perhaps similar to what you gave the FBI. So we're not asking for special treatment, we're asking for treat, treatment that has already had a precedent. Well, I appreciate it. I have some empathy for that position since I was uh, served in the FBI uh, way before my time, apparently, uh, before the uh, new uh, pay scale went into effect for the Big Apple. So uh, I do have some uh, concern about that. The, um, you mentioned the regulations for um, uh, takeovers. Um, currently, uh, do any uh, investment bankers um, pay any fees at all to the SEC in any way uh, related to takeover activity? Not directly. Uh, the the uh, filings uh, uh, the the filings are paid by the uh, by the company um, by the companies involved, not by the investment bankers themselves. But yet the investment bankers uh, rarely lose in these operations. Isn't that the case? I mean, they the investment bankers make an awful lot of money. According to the newspapers, they're making a lot of money. And and yet they don't directly pay any fees, even though they're part of the process well, to a great degree. I presume they pay income taxes. But I mean it specifically to the S. <laughs> we don't want to get into that. That's a, that's a ways and means question. But, but I, I, I'm interested. Not to they, the, not not to to the, the commission, SEC. no. Yeah, thank but you. their activities do. Uh, 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 their their activities do generate fees in the sense uh, the more of this uh, takeover merger activity there is, the higher our fees will be. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The chair wants to commend the gentleman from Ohio for his questions. I'm, Mr. Chairman, I am particularly interested in the points raised by the gentleman from Ohio. It does seem that, the, that there is a certain measure of additional generosity that could be attacked in the area that's been suggested by the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Oxley. I'm curious, is that, is that a correct appreciation on my part? I, uh, I, I don't think it's necessary, sir, that we, uh, uh, that we uh, suggest new revenue sources in order to make the point that the government's already receiving uh, substantially more revenues uh, than we... Uh, that is true, Mr. Than, Chairman, as you very well know. You do deal, however, with people who, for good reason or bad, tend to be rather dense on that particular issue up here and at Office of Management and Budget. It's something I'd like you to have your staff explore with our staff because it does appear to be a desirable component of if, assembling a piece of legislation. If you wish, we can, you. we can give you recommendations regarding uh, fee sources. Uh, it, would be, it would be helpful, I think. Mr. Chairman, you have, were talking with members of the committee here about uh, the insider trading matters that have been dealt with by you and the restitutions that are achieved on behalf of investors under that statute. How much of that will actually ever return to the investors? Well, it takes, uh, it takes a substantial amount of time for the private actions to be, uh, to, to, to go through their in, entire course. Uh, there are still uh, substantial amounts of assets in the Boski uh, related matters which are being held uh, by, by courts waiting for the resolution of the litigation. But, uh, um, and I just don't have um, uh, figures as to whether there is a point at which there's no longer any litigation uh, designed to uh, uh, get at those assets. I, 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 I tend to think that the result will be, uh, the, that that will not be the result. My, my tendency is to think that as long as there is a court-held fund, there will be a plaintiff's lawyer somewhere who is willing to find a theory uh, to litigate so that he can go to that court and say, now this fund ought to be turned over to my clients. But it is, it is a matter of concern. Well, five to seven years should, should be sufficient to yes. afford that kind of innovative and ingenious attorney an opportunity to crack that fund, would it not? Yes, it should. 
indeed uh, uh, my, my own preference for the for the way in which those settlements should be structured would be to uh, to indicate that after a period of years uh, if there are funds remaining in a disgorgement uh, uh, due to a disgorgement settlement that those funds should then go to the US Treasury now uh, mr. chairman the uh, committee and its chairman have expressed to you substantial outrage on your inability to process the whoops case or the WPPS case in a proper manner because of your budgetary problems. What other cases of this kind are, do you have down there that you have not been able to bring into the appropriate civil or criminal process because of lack of funds and staff? To my knowledge, sir, we have not, we have not refrained from bringing any major action where we felt the facts uh, demonstrated a need for such action to be brought. You what, told us that that was the case in, in with regard to whoops. I say, uh, other than whoops. And I, I was questioned a little earlier about the New York City matter, which uh, was before my uh, time at the commission. But it's, what, what the effect it will be is that, in, that if we bring the major cases and litigate them um, um, in a strong way, uh, we will find that we're not able to bring uh, smaller cases, cases which are uh, in, in many ways equally deserving of, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of enforcement action. We've had that appropriate retribution to wrongdoers. That's correct. We have that, uh, we've had that uh, particularly uh, in our Denver regional office where we've had a major case uh, that has caused us uh, to use great resources out there and uh, is that the penny stock matter? It's one of the penny stocks matters. That's right, sir But we are uh, So we find that we can't bring as many enforcement actions in Denver on other penny stock frauds as we would like So what you're telling us is that because of lack of resources you are in fact inhibited from from processing cases That's as right. you really should that's Although correct. you can't indicate to us today exactly the number of cases or the particular cases that 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 would be uh, not receiving the attention of the SEC because of, of funding and personnel limitations. The the area that I am most concerned with right now uh, is the area of growing penny stock fraud in this in this country. There are uh, there are enormous frauds going on in uh, in uh, in the areas we've been able to find, particularly our South Florida, in New Jersey. Uh, in Nevada, in Los Angeles, uh, as well as Denver and Utah, where that kind of scam's been going on for a long time. And uh, we really do need to have greater resources to be able to devote to enforcement activities in, in that area. What are the number of these cases, and what is the amount of money involved in total and on the average amongst these cases? I can't give you... Uh, I, it's very difficult to quantify, but I can tell you that the the dimensions of this activity are um, are really astounding to me. During the during the last six months, we've started a task force to address this problem, and uh, we found, for instance, in one of our examinations, uh, that there were uh, in 19 uh, different uh, broker dealer examinations, we found 14 broker dealers in South Florida who were engaged in activities which I regarded as very, just reprehensible with, with uh, um, uh, markups of securities from, uh, 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 from uh, 25 to 100 uh, percent. We found that these people were making um, uh, millions of dollars, literally selling uh, uh, fake stocks. Um, uh, fake stocks? Fake stocks. I mean stocks with no assets and no discernible business purpose uh, other than skinning investors other than skinning investors they what these what happens is that they they set up these large shops with uh, young people on the telephone uh, and they they're they're calling uh, they're calling uh, investors and they're putting them into these stocks with great promises for the future and they're defrauding them of uh, of two thousand five thousand ten thousand dollars and then we find that the investors won't complain they're afraid to tell their wives and husbands. They're afraid to be embarrassed because they've lost money, and these and these uh, scoundrels are walking away uh, um, uh, free. So uh, we're, we are. Uh, uh, I'm very concerned about this area. What are your authorities to deal with this? We have uh, um, we have enforcement authority to 
to uh, uh, to deny the the broker dealers the opportunity to to uh, to stay in business. Uh, what do you have to do before you achieve that? Well, we have end. to bring a uh, uh, we have to bring uh, an investigative proceeding. We have to go. Can you just suspend their license and make them go out and sue to get it back? No, we 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 have to. Would bring that be a desirable alternative to? We have to bring an administrative proceeding and give them um, uh, give them the the right to uh, to uh, appear. Uh, what are the penalties? Well, we we can bar somebody for life from the industry. How about civil and criminal criminal penalties? We, we can bring civil injunctive actions and uh, and uh, 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 put them under uh, uh, civil contempt if they do it again. Uh, we can obtain disgorgement, uh, but we do not have criminal power. And I, I may tell you that we are meeting, we are working closely uh, with the Justice Department and the FBI in this area. I've met with uh, Mr. Sessions to talk about FBI involvement, and I've uh, I've met. Uh, recently with the head of the NASD to talk about this area and with the National Association of Securities Administrators. What about, what about the NASD? It appears to me that the NASD is not carrying out its responsibilities as a self-regulatory organization when this kind of event is going on amidst their numbers. Is there something the committee ought to suggest with regard to this matter? Well, this, this problem has, is, a, is a matter of, uh, of uh, recent uh, vintage. It's a matter of two or three or four years and it's a it, it's a problem. Well, it's been around two, three, four years. That's two, three, four years that the long, that the say. NASD has had opportunity to address this and has not. Well, now I, are it, do they have do they have the power as a self-regulatory organization to address it? Are they using this power adequately? It appears have, it appears either they don't have the authority or they are not using it. Which well, is they the have case. inspection power, and they have the power to uh, uh, to to levy <coughs> fines and to bar people. Well, maybe, they, maybe, they, maybe a little proceeding bringing the NASD in to explain this matter would be in order at the SEC, or do we have to do it for you? Well, we've been uh, we've been closely in in uh, in, uh, in in conversations with them, and I believe they are um, uh, they are moving in the correct area here. They've they've established a criminal. Uh, 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 this is really criminal activity we're talking about. We're, we're, uh, we we can put these people out of business. But they'll come. They'll pop up like uh, weeds in some other state. Uh, we need to put these people in jail, and um, um, we're, we. That's well, why I'm going to ask you to provide us with a with a report as to what is going on in this particular matter and what needs to be done. Uh, you have piqued my interest, Mr. Chairman, and I think that that uh, all of us need a little bit of assistance in addressing this particular question. Mr. Chairman, you've indicated that other financial regulatory agencies are funded in whole or part by generated fees. Would you please discuss the mechanisms by which these agencies are funded and a rationale for allowing the self-funded status of these agencies? Matter of fact, Mr. Chairman, I think it would probably be useful that you just submitted that for the record. All right. That would probably save both of us time at this particular uh, point. Mr. Chairman, uh, can you tell us what is the application of the Graham-Rudman Balanced Budget, Budget Act to the other self-funded agencies? And what are the Graham-Rudman considerations with regard to changing the SEC from an appropriated to a self-funded agency? Uh, sir, it's my understanding that the suggestions we've made in, um, in, uh, in option three would relieve us from the Graham-Rudman uh, restrictions. Uh, that is, that we would, have a, we would have a fund which would be separate from the normal ap appropriations process, and we would be able to use those funds uh, without Graham Rudman uh, restrictions, uh, I guess I'd have to ask George Kundal to answer Mr. the Kundal, question. Do you want to give us a response two. on that? No, I think the uh, the, the chairman uh, hit it on the head. As to option two, I think we're still within <laughs> Graham Rudman, although I haven't. Well, I think under option two or three, we'd be out from under because option two would still establish a separate fund. All right. Uh, so when the across the board uh, uh, sequestration is applied, we should be immune from that. But uh, right now, we are subject to it. Uh, I believe it was in fiscal year 1986, we uh, suffered a uh, cut along with the rest of the federal government. I, I'm not aware that the, uh, the financial regulatory agencies with independent uh, income sources uh, suffered that cut in 1986. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to direct your attention to another matter. I'd like to refer to the transaction fees and interest paid on that or on them. Transaction fees collected pursuant to the 34 Act are paid at the end of the calendar year 
on which the volume basis of the fees is calculated. Because the fee is collected by the exchanges at the time that each transaction occurs, the provision permits exchanges to earn interest on fees they collect for an average of something like seven months. Is that a correct appreciation? I think you are correct. All right. Now, because these fees are collected pursuant to a federal statutory requirement and are essentially federal government fees from the moment they are collected, why should the government not receive the interest rather than the exchanges receive the interest on these fees? I think the argument is, is perfectly appropriate that the government, uh, that the payments uh, should be made, for instance, as GAO has suggested, on a monthly basis so that the government would receive the interest uh, uh, collected. I may say that the, uh, uh, that the self-regulatory organizations, the exchanges, uh, are, uh, are resources for us. Uh, we, we have uh, insisted that, they, that their enforcement and compliance staffs be increased. We've insisted that their computer operations be increased. So uh, some of that, uh, of the money that is being generated by them from the interest on these fees, uh, I believe is going to uh, 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 governmental activities in, uh, engaged in by these exchanges. And uh, to that, in is, that sense, I think it's probably justified. It is, it is a practice, rather in theory at least, they should, they should fund those activities from the fees which they collect from their members. Is that not so? Uh, I think that's the... Uh, uh, they have to fund their activities from all sources, uh, whether they get them from listed companies, uh, from, uh, from their uh, uh, own members, okay. uh, or from uh, fines which they levy. They have a, a, a fair number. And indeed, they, they make uh, money to some, uh, in the sale of their uh, information as well. Yeah. I, I might add one other reason why why you could justify their uh, their keeping the, the monies for a while in that they incur some costs in collecting the fees and uh, and bundling them and, and transmitting them to the federal government. So that that could be an additional reason for for this system. Very well, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Colonel, I thank you for your assistance to me and to the committee. I'm going to recognize other members now again for questions. Distinguished gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Wyden. Thank you. Uh, very much, Mr. Chairman. With respect to the 1990 uh, budget submittal, uh, Mr. Chairman, the SEC submitted its uh, FY 1990 budget request to OMB, and OMB has made its recommendations. Uh, how much more or less than what you submitted to the Office of OMB did OMB recommend for your fiscal year 1990 budget submittal? Uh, Congressman Wyden, I I'd be willing to answer that question, but I would prefer to answer it to you uh, in, in writing if I could. I, I can tell you that we've had that negotiation, but uh, our agreement with OMB is that we will not reveal uh, and should not reveal uh, the results of our negotiations until the President's budget is, uh, is, uh, uh, is before Congress. Mr. Rudy, you just said the wrong thing. <laughs> it is it is the well settled position of this committee that we're entitled to anything that's going like on it. in this government. <laughs> uh, the, learning this was painful to me, and learning this has been painful to people downtown from time to time. We really would like to know what you have requested, so we can evaluate it against what you were going to get. I have no objection to that being submitted to us, but. Uh, I, I do want you to know that, that we never quibble about our right to have this information. It's, it, it's a very important part of the Congress's ability to oversee the affairs of the agencies under our jurisdiction, and, and it is a very intimate part, as I'm sure you can understand, of the questions before the subcommittee this morning. Matter of fact, it's right at the heart of the matter. If you're asking for money and you're, you're getting cut, uh, we need to know it. We need to know it early enough. We can do something to help you rather than to sit by and gnash our teeth after they've cut your budget. And, and then we can all sit around and, and, and say if, if we, you'd have just gotten more money, we could have we seen, the, seen the agency carry out the function, its functions the way we know you and the other commissioners want to do. Well, if, if you would let me uh, cut the baby in a slightly different direction, I can tell you the results of our, uh, of our negotiations last year. Um, and uh, and if I could, uh, if you if you if you need to have this information we do. Uh, before the the uh, our we, president we, submits we do his early budget, and, and and we don't think it will be hurtful to you. You can tell them you did it under duress, but you can also remind them you work for us and not for them. 
All right. Well, the 1988-1989 budget, uh, George can correct me, I think, if I don't have these right, but I think that our, uh, our, our uh, submission to them uh, with, with adjustments for pay raises and whatnot was at approximately $172 million. And uh, the, uh, the number that went to Congress in the President's budget was what, George? 160.9. 160.9, and the Congress gave us 145. Yeah. So this is 89. That's 89. That's right. Now, now, Mr. Uh, Mr. Wyden was talking about 1990, because the 1980 figures have already been appropriated, and, and we all know that you took something of a beating there. Mr. Wyden. Mr. Uh, Dingle, I, I have in front of me a. Uh, memo that you might find interesting from Harry Truman dated 1946 where he he uh, implores agency heads like like Chairman Reuter not to to uh, be premature in revealing uh, the contents of the president's budget uh, you know the direction we we'll, get we'll, we'll accept it in writing Mr. Condole I just Fine. want you to understand that this committee doesn't accept the thesis that we're not entitled to get it we, we're we're we are doing this more out of humane concern for you and Chairman Reuter than we are out of, out of any concession on principle, and I don't want you to mistake the view of the Chair on this particular matter. Um, and, and, and just parenthetically, since you've mentioned one of my great, uh, great heroes, Harry Truman, I'll observe that, that I thought he was a great president, and he was right most of the time. Uh, <laughs> but uh, my dad, who served with him, and I uh, have never accepted the fact that the White House can assert its wisdom superior to Congress on policy questions where it's the Congress's business. And, and uh, in, this, in this matter, you've got to have to accept my judgment that the President was, and he was a great President, was significantly in error. Gentleman from, thank, gentleman from Oregon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to follow up on this important point uh, that you've addressed, Mr. Chairman. It seems to me when you look at these numbers and the hacking that went on at OMB, that the Commission actually had a shortfall in 1989 from the 1988 appropriation. And that is that the increase all seems to be due to the pay increase in January of 89 and then the other mandatory base increases. And if you look at it in that context and what OMB did to your budget, there was actually a shortfall in 1989 from the 1988 appropriation. Is that right, Mr. Reuter? No. Um, the, uh, the figures that we have previously uh, submitted to uh, Congressman Markey uh, uh, by letter uh, indicate that we requested in 1988 um, $150 million, and the pr President gave us $145 million, and Congress gave us $135 million. That in, and I've told you in 1989, uh, we asked for $170 million. Congress gave us $161 million, and Congress gave us $142 million. The, the, uh, the, the, the uh, I can uh, tell you that the initial, that the, I can tell you that the, the outcome of the 1989 budget process has been to put the Commission under severe strain. We are, uh, I can't tell you that we are, uh, that we're having to cut back our activities, but I can certainly tell you that we're not in a position to increase them. Let us say, uh, if you would, with Chair's permission, have you all review it, that and get it back to us in writing, because it's the staff's understanding that there is actually a shortfall in 1989 from the 1988 appropriation if you factor in those uh, pay yes. increases yeah. in January. Yes, I'm agreeing with you, but okay. I thought you were dealing with the President's no. budget. I'm no. Oh, what, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. The, your number was uh, three million. My mate, uh, mine's somewhat larger than that, actually, compared to what there's some expenses well, that you may not know about. But, but I, I think you yes. have highlighted the point that there is a very real shortfall in 1989 from the 1988 appropriation if you consider that uh, we, a mandatory yes. base increase. I'm sorry, I, I didn't understand your question. We had mandatory increases which we had to meet. Uh, we, we've also prepared in our 1989 fu funding uh, for, the, uh, for the funding of our EDGAR system, which is, uh, which, for which we're going to be, be accepting bids, I think, in the very near future. And that is a, uh, that's a figure that doesn't pop out at you as you look at our 
as our at our budget comparisons very e easily but it has been a uh, it, it, it indeed explains what is an apparent increase in the Commission's budget over the years, which, uh, uh, which is not as large as it might seem because we are uh, going to be funding this f uh, a very costly uh, uh, automated uh, data retrieval system. Let me ask you about the auditing of a self-funded uh, agency. The Federal Reserve Board, a self-funded agency, has its financial statements audited by a big eight accounting firm alternating annually among the uh, eight firms. Would the SEC have a conflict of interest if it were audited by a private accounting firm over which it has regulatory authority? I don't think so. Uh, I think the concept of auditing uh, by an independent public accountant uh, would not be affected, at least as I understand our rules, uh, by the fact that we were subject, uh, that we had uh, regulatory authority over them. If there were an ongoing uh, disciplinary matter, that might be a different case. But, uh, Mr. Wyden, we have not proposed that. Uh, you know, we could conceivably continue to be overseen by GAO, which doesn't have powers for all the, the financial regulatories. We've used the uh, Defense Contract Auditing Agency on occasion. Uh, I think there are alternatives to big eight accounting firms for an agency like the SEC. Well, you, you raise my ne next point. Would uh, it be necessary, say, if one were to use the General Accounting Office to amend the General Accounting Office's charter to allow GAO to audit the SEC if the SEC became self-funded? Uh, we just haven't investigated okay. that question. A couple of other uh, questions very very briefly. Uh, one deals with uh, this question of retention uh, bonuses, uh, Mr. <coughs> Chairman. Your discussion of suggestions for personnel uh, system changes, you indicate that the Commission could be authorized to offer retention bonuses to staff based on performance. Uh, what is the precedent in the federal government for the allowance of such retention bonuses, and what's been the track record of success uh, with agencies that have this authority? Uh, I'm going to let Mr. Kundal expand on what I'm about to say, but we already have within the federal government a, a uh, bonus system. Uh, we, we expend approximately $800,000 uh, each year in providing bonuses to our uh, to our better people, and the bonus system is an important part of our, our system, and I, I think that precedent's there. Perhaps you want to well, add to it, George? Well, obviously the military has provides a lot of precedent, but in the civilian sector, I'm, I'm told that uh, public health service doctors provide an, an additional precedent. Okay. One other question, if I, I might, Mr. Reuter, and that is on, I think, the, the issue of, of the future with respect to securities, and that's this internationalization of the world uh, securities markets. You state, and I think very correctly um, in your report, when individuals trade across borders, hide assets in foreign accounts, shield themselves behind foreign banking laws or domicile in foreign countries, the detection and prosecution of securities laws violators becomes increasingly difficult and expensive. Given the uh, shortage of resources uh, at your agency, what has been the level of SEC enforcement activity uh, involving this kind of international conduct uh, you've described? We've been doing very well at it. We've, we have, uh, we have a, a negotiated a memoranda of understanding with, a, with the most important markets for enforcement uh, procedures. We exchange uh, information. We are sending our people to, uh, uh, to conferences and to bilateral negotiations with the regulators in other countries. Um, um, and uh, thus far, I think we're doing well. I, I think we, as time goes on, I think this area is going to be, in, be increasingly cost, costly. And I'm concerned not only about the enforcement area, but about what I call the surveillance area. That is the matter of looking at the way other markets are conducted for purposes of detecting uh, fraud rather than investigating matters that are already uh, to our, in our attention. And we just don't have an international budget at all. We, we're taking it from uh, bits and pieces of other, uh, of, of other operations uh, in our agency. Well, gentlemen, gentlemen, happy you know, I'd like to know what you need in the way of international budget, what you need in the way of personnel to deal with this, and what you need in, the way, need in the way of offices, what you need in computer assistance and uh, coordination monies to deal with regulatory bodies in other, in other nations so that you can 
address the international component of this problem properly. Would you submit that, uh, submit an appraisal that to us? We haven't done a, a cost analysis of this, uh, and I think it would be a good exercise for us to do it. I, I, can, I know it's in the millions of dollars. Uh, that We'd like we, to have uh, that information, if you please. Could you give us an example of an enforcement action brought in the international uh, arena? Y yes. Uh, um, the the uh, we had it. Uh, we had an international case in which there was uh, a, a tip that was in London. Uh, the the tip uh, uh, the information was that was found in London. It was transmitted to an individual in Los Angeles. The Los Angeles person instructed his broker in Los Angeles to execute the trade in London. Uh, the trade was executed in London, uh, and we brought an enforcement case claiming that the, uh, uh, that the securities laws of the United States uh, were violated by, even though the source of the information was in London and the trading was in London, the tipping and the authorization of the, of the activity uh, was in the United States. And How how prevalent do you see these international practices uh, today? Is this widespread? Uh, Un unfortunately, I think the more sophisticated the criminal, the more likely you are to see the use of uh, entities uh, overseas for the execution of the trades uh, and for the hiding of the money. Uh, you may remember our, uh, our Dennis Levine investigation in which uh, uh, we had uh, Bank Lou in the Bahamas as the repository for, for Levine's uh, 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 illegal uh, um, gains and indeed the source of the, of the transactions themselves. He chose to go out of the United States to conduct, uh, to conduct this illegal activity. So it's, it's, it is uh, something that we're very concerned about and need to, to, to deal with on a, on, in a very vigorous manner. The only other question I had is, is there another bond case another very large case involving, I think, Matthews that you all uh, are looking at that may perhaps not be quite as large as the whoops situation, but be another one that the agency is, let us say, constrained to deal with on the basis of resources? You are aware of the public press relating to the Matthews and Wright matter and allegations that have been made publicly, I'm not allowed to comment on whether or not we have an investigation underway. But it certainly would be, if one were to have an investigation, a very large bond case, not as large as whoops, but certainly another very big, large one. Public, the public statements regarding what happened in the Matthews and Wright case at the end of the at the time of the transition between the tax laws relating to um, uh, uh, industrial development or conduit bonds indicate that, uh, that the activity was substantial, and I would expect from those reports that if a case were brought, the case would be substantial. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I don't have any further questions, but uh, you know, it, just, it just seems to me that at every turn, uh, uh, Chairman Reuter, you all are out, outgunned and, and uh, undermanned, and I don't see how one can move on all these fronts from international markets to penny stocks with the scarcity of resources. So you all have made a, I think, very comprehensive case, and uh, I look forward to working uh, with Chairman Dingell uh, in particular uh, to try to get more resources and uh, hold off uh, those uh, cutters up at Office of Management and Budget who always seem to whack away at some of these uh, budget needs. And Mr. Chairman, I thank you for the time. Yes, questions? Yeah. Um, Council advises me that uh, there will be questions both from the chair and the members of the subcommittee that, and we will have I know Mr. Lent has some questions, and both the staff of the subcommittee and the staff of the minority will be sending, uh, will be assembling questions that the chair will be communicating with you for purposes of record. Could, could record. I ask for a Christmas charity from you, Mr. Yeah. Chairman? <laughs> we would not be required you, to have the staff work on these over the Christmas holidays. We have no intention that you should work on them over Christmas. Thank, uh, thank they you. will be submitted to you after Christmas because I don't intend to work the staff up here either. Uh, over the holiday, we would we would request that 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 
that the record would remain open, whether the record, the chair would note that the record will remain open for approximately 30 days after, after the first of the year so that we can buckle down to some real drafting and, and get started working with your people to try and uh, assist you in this budgetary problem that confronts us all in these matters. Thank you. I, I greatly appreciate your concern for our agency's needs. Uh, we, we, we do, uh, I think, a uh, uh, fine job with the resources we have and we're anxious to uh, expand and to do more work. Well, uh, you, you know the enormous respect I have for you as a person and also for the for the SEC. You, have a, you, you serve on and serve on behalf of a very proud agency with a distinguished record. And uh, we are, we would like to see you have the resources to continue that kind of undertaking. Chair is going to recognize the gentleman from Oregon for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Reuter, since you are here, one just has this almost biological compulsion <laughs> to ask you about um, an unrelated matter. And in particular, as you know, uh, Chairman Dingo and the subcommittee have been looking at the questions of financial fraud and the role of auditors. Uh, in dealing with those frauds. And it seems to me the agency has been sitting for a long, long time on the policy changes involving the 8K for the change of auditor so that we would have an early warning system to let us know uh, with respect to some of these financial frauds uh, you on an earlier point and particularly a, a uh, auditor's uh, change or an auditor's re resignation triggering uh, some notice of these major financial problems. Could you let us know why the delay in dealing with uh, these 8K changes and when one might expect to see the Commission deal with that? Uh, I think the comment period has expired on our, on our uh, 8K proposals. Uh, I don't, do not have a, an indication from the staff where they are on, the, on, the, on that matter at this point, but I will uh, in view of your question, make sure that it comes to the table at a, at a sooner rather than later uh, uh, times. I, I, view, uh, I view this matter uh, as, as being important as well, and I think we need to, uh, to get our rule adopted and, uh, and underway. Would you uh, be able to get back to us on that shortly? Because as, uh, as I understand it, that has been, been kicking around the Commission now for months and months. And we do see that right at the heart of an early warning system in terms of dealing with these financial frauds. And uh, I, I, will, I will find out where it is and get back to you. Uh, I, I'm not going to say that we didn't get at it because of not enough resources, All but right. I, I suppose I could. I, everything goes in order, and I, it's a matter of priorities within each of our divisions. And I will find, uh, I will report to you where, where we are. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Condall, we thank you for your assistance to the committee. The committee will stand adjourned until the call of the chair. They've been thank sitting you, on some of your accounting.